Well, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce um, the chair of our next session, uh, Virginia Price, uh, known to her friends as Gigi Price. Uh, uh, Gigi uh, got her master's in architectural history here at University of Virginia in uh, 1999, uh, right? Yes, and um, has had a wonderful career um, in Washington, working for the National Park Service for many years, um, working at Veterans Affairs, and she tells me that just a couple weeks ago she's taken a new job at the State Department. So please help me uh, welcome Gigi Price. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. Welcome back from lunch, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here at the A School after a number of years. I, well, for a number of years, I drove up and down 29, but it's good to be back again after um, have some time away. I see Richard more often at our um, SAH chapter meetings at different places in the country than I have been able to be back um, in Charlottesville, but that's always a nice reunion and a way to catch up um, with lots of stories. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here as we pay homage to his wit and wisdom that has touched so many directly through his teaching, lectures, and mentorship, and indirectly, as we heard right before lunch, as audiences of America's castles and avid readers of his books, publications, and attendance at his exhibitions. Um, some career advice that Richard gave me long ago when we were in orientation, we'd done our tour of the lawn, and we were sitting in the midst of his subject, McKim. Uh, meet in white, and he said, well, you know, pick your topic and ride your subject up, <laughs> and, and your career will be made. Um, I'm not sure I did that exactly, but I did get my first job at the Park Service um, bumping elbows with another architect in our summer studio here at UVA, so I follow his advice in my own way. Um, our panel this afternoon explores the ideals and representation of culture and state, which is somewhat germane to my new job, bringing together four panelists whose presentations address the interplay of national and international influences in American architecture and the avant-garde, and in doing so, highlight Richard's scholarship and that that he encouraged us to pursue in examining this exchange. Um, to begin our panel this afternoon is Brian Clark Green. Brian is the Director of Preservation for Commonwealth Architects in Richmond, Virginia, and his work involves documenting, analyzing, and managing historic resources through an understanding of the programs, technologies, and administrative systems inherent to their protection. He teaches at Virginia Commonwealth University and serves as the chair for the City of Richmond's Commission of Architectural Review and is the chair of the Society of Architectural Historians Heritage Conservation Committee, where we work together somewhat. He's tireless in his advocacy. Brian also sits on the Urban Design Committee for the City of Richmond and on the Citizens Advisory Council on the furnishing and interpreting of the Executive Mansion. He's a member of the SEH Board of Directors and an honorary member of the, AI, of the AIA in Virginia. He received his MA and PhD here from the university. Brian? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this afternoon, and I really appreciate it. And the, the building I'm going to show you this afternoon is um, one that I think um, owes a lot to Richard. And one of the great things I think gifts Richard gave me was to, um, and others, was to teach us to look not just at buildings, but to look at the connections beyond buildings, to look to art history, to look to photography, to look to sculpture, which will be particularly of importance in this building, and to look beyond that. And, um, um, and, and as we do that... Oh, I'm sorry. Did I fall? Ah. That's all the kerfluffle was about. I thought something terrible was going on. All right. So, um, so to that end, um, what I'm going to do this afternoon is, is look at this building through those, through those orbits of those many connections in the way that Richard taught us all to look at those buildings and to look for those connections, to look beyond the building itself. And also, when looking at the building, to look at the many ways in which the building reaches beyond itself, the way the building ages, the way the building moves through time, the way the building requires care, restoration, and all those many things that happen afterwards. And for those of you following along on the Wilson visual curve, we are far off to the right, very far off to the right. So, so to begin, I'm going to tell you a little bit today. We're going to talk about this building. This is the... Um, the Belgian, Belgian Pavilion. This was built for the 1939, Chicago, 1939 New York World's Fair. 
it was intended to be dismantled, returned, brought back to Belgium after the war, and it didn't happen. Um, this, 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 um, the, well, the Germans invaded, and um, and um, as a result, it stayed in the United States and had a very odd second life. And so, I know one of the things Richard used to always say is, "Well, well you know, what, what, what's American about it?" Well, indeed, what is American about this building? It was designed in Belgium, constructed in Belgium, prefabricated panels, shipped to the U.S., constructed in New York, dismantled, moved to Richmond, rebuilt in a smaller form, and, um, and it's lived a very rough life since then. So, it's, um, so with that in mind, let's take a look. So again, this is one of the very few buildings that survived from the 39 World's Fair, designed largely under the direction of um, Henry Van de Velde. And... It parallels, it has a very interesting parallel history when it gets to Richmond. And the building, the, the campus I'm showing you below is Virginia Union University, and which also, it's a uh, historically African-American college, um, which has a very interesting origin, which I'll go into, which plays into this. But both of these buildings have very complex histories that um, very much tied into Jim Crow, Virginia, and uh, the challenges that are faced by HBCUs today, which are largely financial and administrative. And anyone who's done any architectural work in HBCU knows what the, the, those challenges are like. So Virginia Union has its origin in this building you see on your left, labeled the old jail. This was a, a, holding, um, a holding pen for slave auctions in Shaka Bottom, Richmond. This is on 15th Street. Uh, this was a place where um, um, enslaved workers were transported and held uh, for auctions, which you see on your left. Um, there's a neighborhood called the Devil's Triangle. Um, most of this doesn't exist anymore, which I'll show you. It's physically been removed. Um, what it speaks to is, um, in Richmond, a series of spaces that were relegated for use by African Americans that were spaces that the white community did not want. And when the white community wanted it back, it reclaimed them with a vengeance, pushed the African American community back out to another marginalized area, and eventually reclaimed that. So what I'm showing you on your left is the area... Um, roughly with the site marked where Lumpkin's jail was, um, and um, to give you a sense of, of, of where it is. Um, so um, what happened was um, there was a, uh, a cemetery that was established very close, uh, right, next to the, um, right next to the burial ground. Um, we lost that when the interstate... Well, whoops, let me jump forward here. Oops. Sorry, I'm getting tangled in my slides. Um, the important thing to, make, to remember is that um, the founding of the uh, univer founding of Virginia Union University is, is um, tied up with the uh, the, Dal the Walton Act in 1894, which held ultimately separate, not equal. This became part of Plessy. The thing to remember in Virginia is that separate is not equal; it's just separate, and we'll see that as we move through these. So, through a series of mergers, the uh, the first classes were held in that very slave uh, jail that I showed you. Uh, it was a Freedman school was established in, in the very slave holding pen. Literally, all they did was remove the bars from the windows and the, the manacles from the floor. And the first classes were taught there. It eventually became called the Culver Institute and, uh, and then became a Freedman school. And then through a series of mergers, became part of what was called Virginia Union University. And, um, and I show you that here. Um, but the merger happens against the backdrop of this constant push in this constant, um, so for example, I'm showing you the, the first location of the first African burial ground and the second, the second location. Again, they're separate but far from equal. Each of these spaces is reclaimed um, by the white community, pushing the black community further out. Um, in each case, the dead were left behind. The cemeteries were relocated, but all the dead were left behind. Um, and I show you here just kind of the fate of both of them. The first cemetery is located on the left. This is... Um, as you can see in construction, in, um, this is Interstate 95, uh, which flies over it. So if anyone's been in Richmond, the cloverleaf that takes you into downtown Richmond is on top of the first African burial ground in the city of Richmond. The second site to which they were pushed off to is on the north side. I show you that on your right. Um, that's had its own series of indignities. Um, during the evacuation in April, April 3, 1865, a munitions dump next to the, the African-American cemetery is blown up, blew up about half of the cemetery. Um, when it was leveled and cleaned up, it was given to the white community. Um, the remainder was on the downslope that you see here. This was actually lost in 2007 uh, after a hurricane, and FEMA came in and rip-wrapped it. Didn't, no one knew what it was. Um, so, so this long history of, of being pushed out um, 
led to the establishment of Virginia Union University, again, through a series of mergers, um, created this university, which was on its own compound, its own separate. It has maintained a very separate identity from the city around it. Interestingly, all the buildings are built of a northern imported granite. Um, there's only one other building in the city that's built of the same stone. I don't know why, but it's very expensive and very intentional. Um, they hired a ball, an architect from Buffalo, um, John Coxhead. Uh, no one local was involved in the construction of this, so far as I can tell. Now, this is the background. Um, so we all know about the 1939 World's Fair. Again, celebrating motion, modernity, um, newness. And um, part of that is this, the, the, uh, the Belgian pavilion, which was built um, by, um, by the nation of Belgium for display. Now, what they're displaying in particular is um, mineral extraction. And they're celebrating the removal of minerals from the Congo and the exploitation of those. That's really the mission of this, is to sell diamonds and sell gold. Um, and um, you don't see there are very few photographs of the interior, so you really don't, um, you really don't get that. But it's that larger mission of the um, um, sort of intellectual mission is that sort of push for, for you know, modernity. And I just show you two ways of conceptualizing the fair here. These are two images directly of it. On your left is Stuart Davis's painting, Impressions of the World's Fair. And on your right is a teacher in the same year, in 1939, teaching um, about the World's Fair to a, a group of kids in a classroom with obviously no electricity and no water. And if I zoom in, the drawing on the chalkboard is actually the pylon and um, trisphere. And you can only imagine what these kids must be taking away from this and trying to conceptualize a place that's thousands of miles away and so entirely different. And yet this is what you're trying to teach them about this. It's just, again, these, these, um, these contradictions that are fraught through this story. So the Belgian Pavilion is constructed in 39. And shortly after the opening of the fair, um, again, everyone involved with the building is uh, Belgian. It's, this is Henri van der Velde, who later would um, um, head up the um, Arts and Crafts School at Weimar, which became the, um, became the Bauhaus. It's, um, all the materials are Belgian. It's, um, it's some tile, some terracotta, a lot of glass. Um, everything was thought to be nationalized. Uh, it's 100,000 square feet, very large building. And notice particularly the tower on your left. It's, um, it's a steel tower clad in tile, um, with a, um, uh, a glass running full height. It's illuminated from the interior. It's quite striking. Um, these are the architects um, um, as they're working with it. Um, and this just gives you a sense of some of the color, um, the color in the building before it was um, dismantled. Now, just for context, if you want, you might ask yourself, what's happening in 1939 here at the University of Virginia? Well, right over here in Fairweather Hall, 1940, this is a student drawing for a, um, a clubhouse, private sportsman's clubhouse. Um, and we often think of this as the sort of thing that's being done here in Virginia at that time. And so, you know, it doesn't take much to, to look at this building and see it's, it's, you know, where it comes from and, and how it got where it is. This was in a studio um, taught by Stanislaw Mikelski, and this is his um, American Vignola and all of his drawing exercises, which he was using for students. And he was, remember, this is, um, he was one of the first, he was in the first graduating class from the university and Fisk Kimball's first faculty hire here. So we're talking about a very long tradition. But there were other voices here. Um, the same student, Robert Dennis, also drew the same year. It was either the same year or the year before. It's only labeled as a Class B project. A very strikingly similar building to what we're seeing going up in the World's Fair, a large entertainment pavilion with big free spans and um, you know, a, a large internally illuminated tower. I don't know, but just to suggest that you know, UVA is not... There are other voices, and modernity never became the dominant voice in Virginia architecture. In fact, it's very hard to find it. Um, it's very hard to find much mention of the, the Belgian Pavilion in the literature on Virginia architecture. It's just, it's just not there. So, so the difficulty with the pavilion is shortly after opening, the, um, the Germans invade Belgium, and the decision is made very quickly that this building is not going to be returned, that no part of this will be sent back. And, um, and so they, they very quickly open up a competition to, um, essentially it's a, an essay contest for American universities that have a need for a building to find a new home for this. And this is Virginia Union in, um, um, right, right, before, right, right before the building was moved. And um, they didn't have an auditorium, they didn't have a library, they didn't have a gymnasium. And, and so um, it was thought this would be um, you know, 
th this would be a great need. It would be a great match. And so the, uh, the Rockefeller supported this. The General Baptist Fund um, underwrote much of the move. And, and unfortunately, in a move that, that was to be echoed in many projects throughout the years, the, the budget doubled in the course of what they thought it would take to move the building down. It went horribly over budget, and a lot of shortcuts were made during installation. And this, is, this has been very much part and parcel of the story of this building. Uh, the building was also reduced. It started at um, uh, 100,000 square feet in New York and is reduced to 41,000 square feet in three parts. So the building on your left is a, um, um, is a library. The building in the center is a science building. And the building on the right is a, uh, is a gymnasium. And, um, and here it is under construction. Um, all steel framed. It's a very interesting building. It was built as a temporary building to be erected very quickly. It's a steel frame with um, um, horizontal steel purlins and um, concrete backup, and tiles are wired back through that. It's a very interesting system. Um, um, everything, of course, it's custom. And I should point out, everything in this building is metric. So um, uh, my firm has been, we've did a lot of work on this, and um, it's really tough. It's <laughs> nothing, nothing is off the shelf. Nothing, everything requires something to be custom. Uh, there's, there's nothing easy. Um, <clears throat> but in the reconstruction, one of the things that was left behind that they did not move were the interiors. And this gives you a sense of what the interiors were like. And again, think of this as a, um, this is really a celebration. Most of the interpret, and there are very few photographs of the interior in New York, but really celebrating the mineral extraction out of the Congo. And um, the, the, the quote that they used was, you know, drawing the best from the soil of the Congo. And um, you can only imagine what that meant. Um, I mean, it meant this. Um, this was drawing the best from the soil. These were... Um, gold and copper mines, um, some diamond extraction. But it was all based on um, mineral extraction from the Congo going back to, um, back to Belgium. Now, the contradictions are, of course, obvious. Um, if anyone knows anything about Virginia Union University, one of the great things about this university is it, it produced some of the most important civil rights workers in, in Virginia. Um, Doug Wilder was a, is a graduate. Um, you know, if anyone's involved in democratic poli politics in Virginia, you know that generation that's, that are now in their 60s and older, um, African-American civil rights leaders, elected officials. Um, Virginia Union is the producer. The school produced um, teachers, social workers. Um, it, it's an incredible institution. Um, and um, one of the great difficulties in, in interpreting, trying to understand, it comes to grips with what happened here, is um, the sculptural program that's on the building. The exterior sculptural program was moved. And if you look right over the shoulders of the students, this is students walking to graduation in 1968, you see some of the panels. And if we move in a little closer on the panels, you start to see what they are. And um, there are two different um, sets of major sculptural panels on the building. This one is a two-part um, panel by Arthur DePagna. Um, the left panel celebrates this is, uh, you know, what, what the uh, Belgians found when they went to the Congo, and on the right are the civilizing influences of the Belgians. Uh, it's, it's not subtle. Um, it, it's, um, and, um, you know, and again, the, the emphasis is on, um, you know, how great the colonial experience has been and how much better we've made things. Um, it's really difficult, and, um, you know, these are on the exterior of the building, and, you um, um, they're, they're pretty much unavoidable. Um, and, you know, uh, of course, you know, as you know, the, the, the context is incredibly different now. And this just gives you a sense up close of some of the, the sculptural program on them. And again, of what you, you see on the right-hand panel, this was, you know, we're bringing clothes and shoes and um, Christianity. And everyone's better, right? Right? What could go wrong? Um, and there's a second sculptural panel that's on uh, another part of the building, a much larger one. This one's huge. It's uh, 16, feet, 16 feet long, each panel, two panels, uh, 10 feet high. This is a terracotta panel. And this is another um, set of sculpture focusing on, um, again, mineral extraction and, again, the celebration of uh, mining and the removal, removal of, of minerals from, um, from the Belgian to, to, be, to be brought back, uh, from the Congo to be brought back to Belgium. Um, now, the university's always had kind of a very interesting position towards these. Um, I know um, um, Doug and I worked together. We started this project off years ago, and I remember in the interview room, Doug started to talk about the panels. And I remember, like it was yesterday, one of the university representatives put his hands up, no, 
no, we don't talk about them. Just cut them, cut you right off. Um, I remember it. Um, and the university's taken some interesting positions over the years. Um, for years, they tried the, did the tried and true Virginia strategy of plant boxwoods. And um, <laughs> they just planted a row of boxwoods in front and cultivated them so you couldn't see the, um, couldn't see the sculptures. They've, they've since trimmed them down. Um, um, but all of this brings up a very interesting set of questions. And so, you know, after it's been brought to Virginia, this should, should have been a great landmark of, of modern architecture in Virginia by all, by all measures. This was a, it's an important building with an interesting history. Um, it almost completely disappeared from the press. Um, there's almost no mention of it in either the um, African American papers or the white papers. It just isn't mentioned after, it's, after the flurry of activity when it's open. It just disappears completely. And um, it also suffers from the problem that, you know, it's not one of these. You know, it doesn't have columns, right? And um, it doesn't fit easily into that narrative of Virginia architecture. It doesn't fit into that story. And so it drops out of the, the architectural story as well. And so both its social history and its architectural history just, just go mute. And, and a third narrative that drops out is that the university itself doesn't know what to make of it. Um, for the university, these are the buildings that speak to its history. These are the buildings that speak to it emerging from the Devil's Triangle and moving out of a, out of a slave jail into their own buildings, their own granite buildings that they own on their own campus that were administered by them. No one will tell them how to run this school. This is the story of their separation and independence and ultimate victory. And the Belgian building doesn't fit into that narrative very well either. Um, and in fact, um, it starts, it's, they start to struggle. It's, um, the, the building has many, many, um, many difficulties. Um, and as early as 1966, the university planned to demolish it. Um, this is the demolition plan. They were going to replace it with a new auditorium. They just wanted it gone. Um, it didn't happen. And over the years, there have been various attempts to uh, repair the building. You can see people have, on, on, the, on the right, you see some new windows that were put in. in um, I had nothing to do with these. Um, <laughs> um, and it, what you're doing, you're getting off the shelf storefront. And it's basically storefront that's just um, jammed in with spacers in the end to try to make it fit the window. Um, ran out of money during the 2006 restoration. And the upper floor, this was where the library used to be. The library has moved to a new building, and it went dead stop. Much of the building is just used for storage. Um, 2007, it was hit. Um, 2006 was hit by hurricane, ripped the ceilings off, uh, um, much water intrusion. There are horrible drop ceilings all through the building. Um, they're at about 13 feet. Their ceilings are all 20 feet, and you wouldn't know it. Um, I finally found one of the maintenance guys one time and asked him. I could never find in the drawings, why did you put drop ceilings in at this level? Finally, I asked, must have asked 20 people. And finally, one guy chirped up and said, well, it was easy. We had 12-foot ladders, three rungs from the top. I put my hand like that. That's where the ceiling goes. Good. Okay. Um, but, um, but massive water damage throughout the building. Uh, they were in the middle of um, restoring the tower and putting the uh, cladding back on and relighting the tower when a hurricane hit and blew the cladding back off the tower. And so as a temporary measure, um, the tower's been clad in IFAS since 2006. Um, and it, as temporary things go, it will be a very long time before um, anything happens. Um, so there's the conundrum. So you have a building that was given as a gift, uh, which has now become a burden. And um, its very uniqueness is, is what causes much of the difficulty. And like all unique things, you know, unique buildings fail uniquely. And it means that solutions you use in other places don't work. Enormous expense to make any repair. Again, every door opening, every window opening is metric. Uh, nothing, nothing can come off the shelf. Uh, these are the terracotta tiles, um, and they're bad, bad, bad damage. And you can see how they, they just kind of sit in a tray, and they're wired back to the backing. But um, there's been a lot of uh, terrible thermal cycling in that system, and they, they crack, and, there's, and they, they just crack right down the line. Unfortunately, it means um, each piece has to be cast and fired separately. There's only two places in the United States that make terracotta anymore. And um, so you can imagine the expense of firing new tiles to bring into this place. Um, we've done a lot of repairs to the building over the years. You see uh, there's a lot of st structural repairs going on. Unfortunately, nothing, um, nothing on the exterior. Um, 
again, um, you know, we're, we're talking about a university that has a long and rich history that began in this building in which humans were sold into slavery. And so moving on to a campus that represents a way to get away from that, that represents its emergence from that, and its way of, of, of protecting itself from um, a Jim Crow Virginia. And again, getting a building, that a gift that should have been, sh could have changed the university. It could have injected that narrative into a, a, a different cultural narrative in Virginia, different architectural narrative. Um, but it didn't happen. It didn't fit the way Virginians think about architecture. It didn't fit the way Virginia Union thought about itself. And so it remained stranded. And we have that layer of this sculptural program on the outside that is, is you know, at best racist and, and really speaks to subjugation in a, in, a, in a very loud voice. And if anything, the events of the last few years have made that more difficult. Uh, Virginia Union was one of the um, first schools to participate in sit-ins in, um, in the South. This is 1960 um, in February. These were the first sit-ins. This was right after um, the ones in North Carolina, a few days. And this is the campus that, that's generating these folks. And if anything, we learned from two years ago that you know, public art now takes on a very different meaning. Um, this is, uh, of course, these were actually this, were taken the day before the Unite the Right rally. And so the very way we think about public art now is different, and it's charged. And so um, you know, what do we do? Um, so we're stuck with a building now that has a very um, unshared past and an uncertain future. And, and it speaks to that contradiction of modernism and that difficulty of telling stories that don't quite fit. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next, I'd like to welcome David McKinney. He's an architectural historian and retired administrator. Prior to his retirement, he established the history program and served as the chief historian for the U.S. Customs and Border Protection from 2009 to 2015. He came to the Customs and Border Patrol from the Department of the Interior, where he served as the chief of cultural resources in the office of the secretary. In retirement, he remains active with the American Alliance of Museums as an assessor for its museum assessment program. He has a B.A. in history from the College of William and Mary and an M Master's in Architectural History and Ph PhD in Architectural History from the University of Virginia. His paper this afternoon is entitled Psychedelic Patriotism. Please welcome David. Before I start, I just wanted to welcome Richard into retirement. We'll tell you one thing. You're going to have a lot less a lot more time on your hand, and those wonderful gestures that you make of framing your points, you're not going to do that anymore. So I wondered what to do to help you along in this transition. So I found the Peter Max Book of Needlepoint. <laughs> it's a step-by-step -step guide. So now when you are just contemplating those ideas, instead of telling them, you'll have something to do with your hands. <laughs> I have to say, a, right now, I feel a little bit like an outlier in that I'm not talking about architecture. Instead, I'm looking at how the national identity is presented in art commissioned by the federal government. Specifically, signs with images by Peter Max that were placed at ports of entry along the nation's borders. You see one before you now. I begin by posing the question, psychedelic patriotism? <laughs> Now, if you take umbrage at my combining the terms psychedelic and patriotism, I have already succeeded in resurrecting some of the emotion and controversy around this topic. So I hope that we can now explore how the controversy was more than a liking or disliking of the work of Peter Max. It was a fight over how the national image uh, would be portrayed to visitors to America. So I think today what I'm really asking is this. Can psychedelic art be as representative of America as the, uh, <clears throat> uh, as the ideas of the, of, excuse me, 
I skip a, a sentence here. I'll start again. <laughs> Can psychedelic art be as representative of America as the flag, the eagle, and apple pie? Representations of national identity in art are part of statecraft. In the U.S., such expressions have not been monolithic, especially in turbulent times. And I've lost my clicker. Sorry. Oh, is this one? Okay, there are three of them here. <laughs> Throughout his teaching and scholarship, Richard Guy Wilson has noted that, quote, periods of physical and social change have led to alternating visions of the American experience. In the exhibition, American Renaissance, he examined themes of national identity beginning with the American centennial. Today, I would like to explore how alternating visions of the nation played out 100 years later during the bicentennial of the nation. I think um, technology can smell fear for some reason. Um, <laughs> Uh, arrows on the keyboard. Here we go. Go right down here. Oh, right here. A fourth way of doing this. So, did you get to your next one? Give us just a moment. Ah, okay. yay. I don't know what I did. We'll have this trouble again in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> The image before you is a port of entry to the United States at Calexico, California. In front of the building is a sign with a reproduction of an acrylic painting by P the artist Peter Max. The sign was commissioned by the General Services Administration, or GSA. This federal agency is responsible for constructing and maintaining government buildings like the one you see in the background. The U.S. Customs Service opposed the placement of this sign and approximately 160 others at all ports of entry. The Customs Service was the Bureau of the Treasury Department that was tasked with screening items uh, for entry into the country. In short, GSA maintained the building that you see before you. The Customs Service, along with the Immigration and Naturalization Service, staffed the building. The welcome signs were commissioned to celebrate or to commemorate the nation's bicentennial. And I think it's important that we review just what had occurred prior to 1976. It worked. A youth movement, sometimes referred to as hippies or flower power, had embraced ideals that seemed contrary to mainstream America. A segment of this movement was associated with a drug culture, specifically LSD, often referred to as acid. This movement actively protested the Vietnam War. It blamed President Richard Nixon for not bringing the conflict to an end. There, President Nixon had resigned in disgrace on August 9, 1974. His successor, Gerald Ford, had lost public favor for pardoning him of criminal actions Moreover, and important to, for us today, Ford was left administering what seemed like the failed policies of the Nixon administration. The fall of Saigon and the chaotic retreat from Vietnam occurred in April 1975 under President Ford's watch. This was viewed as the first time in American history that the U.S. had ever lost a war. Now Ford faced a fractured nation and a re-election campaign. It was also the bicentennial year, and even the commemoration of 200 years of American independence was in trouble. This led to the creation of the in-house or the White House Bicentennial Task Force. This task force consist consisted of political operatives like Dick Cheney, charged with rescuing the bicentennial from what the Washington Star called disarray. Under the offices of the National Archives, the GSA submitted act 
the GSA submitted bicentennial activities for the task force review and approval. Following pages and pages outlining the programs of the National Archives, it snuck in this list. And, and it's actually the previous slide. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> At the top, you see the reference to Peter Max and the welcome signs. After approval by the task force, GSA's activities were officially sanctioned by the American Revolution Bicentennial Administration, or in government parlance, ARBA. In April 1976, ARBA announced that Peter Max, quote, a modern art innovator, had been selected to create a series of murals to greet visitors to the U.S. The importance given to this commission may be inferred by the, its placement in the Bicentennial Times. It's buried in an article on the very last page. But for our purposes today, I call your attention to the designation of Max as a modern art innovator. GSA's choice of Max was unusual, especially since the National Archive, the custodian of the Declaration of Independence, was a component of GSA. But Max was extremely popular. He dominated the commercial art market during the 1960s and 70s. His creations ranged from paintings to mass-produced posters, even to housewares. He had even designed a postage stamp commemorating Expo 74, and he was particularly well known for his appeal to the under-25 generation. And he personified the immigrant success story. Max was born Peter Max Finkelstein in Berlin, Germany on October 19, 1937. His family fled Nazi persecution and moved to Shanghai, China, where his father imported and sold European goods to the Chinese and expatriate communities. Max observed how his parents set trends and established their social standing through what they sold to the public. His family had to abruptly abandon Shanghai their business, and all their belongings in 1947 in advance of Mao Zedong's takeover of mainland China. This experience made Max an extreme anti-communist, pro-American, and very much a capitalist. They relocated to Brooklyn in 1953, where Max became fascinated with pop culture as it appeared on television. From his telling, Max developed his artistic sensibilities, I would say, his commercial prowess by watching how products and their advertisements celebrated and advanced the American way. In 1965, Max took the first of his periodic sabbaticals to concentrate on his art and develop a distinctive style. Central to this style is what he calls the flow of the line, which he credits to the pintail felt tip pin, which we see here, this allowed him to draw complete images without lifting his pen from the paper. His 1971 self, uh, their portrait, also pictured here, it illustrates this technique. And I would say it also may speak to the size of his ego. <laughs> the felt tip pen gave him greater flexibility to, to draw figures. Then he added color. This is illustrated in two works that he did in 1972 the Satguru Teacher of Light, and the Satguru Om. His style was well known and outlined in the popular press. His current biography profile of 1971 characterized it as this, quote, a highly personalized, exuberant, and psychedelic style that has been described as crisp electricity. What Max did for the art world was to bring the genre of psychedelic art into the commercial market. I would argue that he brought the nomenclature psychedelic art into the public realm, but not really the genre. Sorry about this one on the right if you're after lunch. Um, <clears throat> his art stood apart. It was commercial. It was meant to be part of everyday life. He referred to it as artist life. If he'd had Richard, he would have called it the art that is life. Uh, one of Richard's exhibitions, sorry. Uh, that's my last aside. <laughs> uh, the other practitioners of uh, the psychedelic uh, genre, which you see in the very busy one on the right, 
um, wanted to transport viewers into altered, sta uh, into altered states similar to LSD trips. Works like this Gerald Oster's Frenzy in the Eyeballs were meant to disorient the viewer through the use of patterns that created disturbing optical illusions. <laughs> Conversely, Max's compositions were fanciful. Here is his self-portrait of 1968. Feelings of euphoria were symbolized by replacing the eyes with flowers instead of the frenzied eyeballs of Oster. Max's decision to employ figurative representation led Horizon magazine to distinguish his art as realistic hallucinations. By 1969, Max was celebrated in print and on television as the prince of psychedelic art. He received this moniker as much for the excesses of his lifestyle as for his art. He was also hailed as the hippie millionaire. By 1976, he was poised to make the boldest statement of his career. He had already produced a series of paintings to commemorate the bicentennial. They were reproduced in the book, uh, Peter Max Paints America. But for us, what is of interest to us today is on the back cover. It notes in red down at the bottom. This art collection coincides with the opening of the Peter Max border murals that will be greeting almost 300 million visitors yearly to America at over 150 border entry stations. In other words, every person entering the US would see a reproduction of a Peter Max work. So how did he get this extraordinary commission and why? It comes down to one person. He owes the border mural commission to this man, Arthur Solomon. Uh, excuse me, Arthur Sampson. I'm getting ahead of myself. The GSA administrator. Sampson became administrator after serving GSA as commissioner of public buildings. He revived the art and architecture program, which he hoped would usher in the golden age of America, American sculpture. Commissions were given uh, to modernists like Alexander Calder to create oversized artworks to be placed in front of federal buildings. Calder's stable, titled Flamingo, which dates from 1973, was commissioned by GSA and a favorite of Samson's. Indeed, he kept a model of it in his office. So this leads to another question. What made Samson do it? Why would the head of GSA, who oversees the National Archives, choose to commission new artwork to commemorate the bicentennial instead of using a historic image from the National Archives? Yes, he had an interest in modern art, but there's also another reason. The answer may be found in the 1972 annual report for GSA issued under Samson as acting administrator. Titled A New Way, the report announced that, quote, GSA refuses to share the image of government as a distant, arbitrary, and pregnable fortress. In short, Samson had started a rebranding campaign for GSA and the federal government. Two years later, GSA adopted, in its words, a fresh image beginning with a new agency logo. The logo used modern typeface to convey an up-to-date agency that employed technology like data processing to achieve its mission. The new logo was employed in all GSA publications and featured in GSA buildings. Both the use of the lettering and its placement in circular patterns were established elements of the psychedelic art movement. In the 1960s, Gerd Stern, a co-founder of the Psychedelic Art Collaborative, USCO, started using cutout words to create collages in poetry. And the most prevalent example was the representation of his poem, which you see there, Take the No Out of Now. Samson wanted to extend a fresh image of the federal government to its international borders. He proposed large images that would be posted at all U.S. ports of entry. They were essentially billboards that measured four by six feet. They were designed to be seen by pedestrians or motor traffic driving 15 to 20 miles per hour. So where did Samson get the idea? Believe it or not, from soda pop advertisements. 
According to the director of special projects at GSA, Samson got the idea from 7-Up advertisements. Samson saw them and thought Peter Max. Ironically, they were done by other artists. Although to this day, Max is sometimes credited with their creation. This 1969 billboard was created by John Alcorn. From 1969 to 1975, the J. Walter Thompson Company mounted a national advertising campaign that used generational differences to distinguish 7-Up from Coke and Pepsi. It dubbed 7-Up the Uncola. The company newsletter noted that Quote, seven up advertising tells people that of the three top selling soft drink brands, seven up, the Uncola, is the only one with distinctly different qualities. This advertising campaign included roadside billboards with colorful images associated with the youth culture. Here is an advertising supplement from 1974 showing how to collect all the seven up billboard images. Like the seven up billboards, the welcome signs featured different images. Seven and all, and I'll tell you up front, I know of no correlation between seven up and seven murals. The subjects of these paintings were developed by Max in consultation with GSA. The murals were intended to reinterpret uh, American ideals. The subjects were divided into categories. Statements of American values that illustrated tried and true American dictums like one nation under God and many, the color spectrum of America, one country, many faiths. Representations of the American spirit and in this case also the burgeoning uh, the NASA project of going to the moon and also very much including the spirit, as part of the representations of the American spirit, the cosmic jumper, an iconic character featured in many of Max's work, and we saw earlier in the Expo 74 stamp. Finally, a celebration of natu America's natural resources. The welcome sign installation was brought to an abrupt halt in 1976 by Vernon Acri, Commissioner of Customs. He thought they were an American. He deemed them unsuitable because of, quote, psychedelic colors and images that became synonymous with drugs during the 1960s. His underlying reason reflected a realignment of the Customs Service to reflect both the policy concerns and the rhetoric of the Nixon and Ford administration. This realignment characterized customs agents at, as foot soldiers in the war against drugs and the international border, the front line. And it was a war that customs invited the news media to cover. In other words, while GSA didn't want the government to be seen as an impregnable fortress, Acre wanted to, uh, to display exactly that idea at the nation's border. For Acre and the administration, it was not just interdicting drugs, it was also addressing all the bad influences that encourage illicit drug use. Among these bad influences was psychedelic art. Life magazine had dubbed it LSD art in 1966 and noted that, quote, most of the producers of psychedelic art have taken drugs and used their hallucinatory visions as guides for their work. This article also linked art and drugs to discotheques and, and, and the lyrics of rock music. A syndicated columnist warned of the guerrilla warfare used by the psychedelic movement to infiltrate America and psychedelicize suburbia. And yes, the button you see on the right was actually sold by proponents of psychedelic art. While Max was not cited in either article, he was the best-known artist associated with this genre. During the debate over the welcome sign, the Washington Post questioned him about his drug use. He responded that he had experimented with LSD, but credited yoga as more an influence on his work. <laughs> the Customs Service opposition to the welcome signs had immediate impact on Peter Max. It caused him to change both his lifestyle 
and his art. In an interview with People magazine, he denounced the excesses of his youth and announced a new approach to painting. This was primarily a change in subject, not in style or technique. He told the interviewer, gone are the star-covered uh, gurus. He initiated this style with a painting of the Statue of Liberty. This also signaled that he would feature the established symbols instead of personal visions of American ideals. What began as an intergovernmental squabble grew into a public debate on the pages of the nation's newspapers. It also extended into the Carter administration where the Max Welcome signs found a new champion at GSA, Joel Solomon, and a new adversary in Customs Commissioner Robert Chasen. Solomon's championship of the murals boiled down to this. Like, since the government paid for them, they should be used. But he also had another very important consideration. They could be employed to give his agency and him personally public visibility. Chasen, on the other hand, rejected the installation, citing the reasons given by his predecessor. In upholding this decision, Chasen and the Customs Service went even further. They attacked all of modern art. As noted in the Washington Post, both sides of the mural debate talked about the controversy in terms of acceptance or rejection of modern art. Speaking on behalf of the Customs Service, Roland Raymond dismissed the sign stating that modern art is not really for the uninformed traveler. Solomon, who had been an operative in the Carter presidential campaign, pressed his case at the White House. It helped that President Carter was familiar with Max. Indeed, Carter had a Max painting in the private residence at the White House. With Carter's backing, GSA prevailed upon Chasen to support the installation of the welcome signs. This agreement came with a compromise. As far as the federal government was concerned, neither the artist nor the murals would be referred to as modern. A series of unveilings of the welcome signs occurred on July 4th, 1978, two years after the bicentennial. Ceremonies took place in the capital cities of Washington, D.C., Ottawa, Mexico City, and at most border stations. The press rollout of these ceremonies differed, pre uh, the, excuse me, the press rollout of these ceremonies differed from previous statements to the media. The welcome signs were no longer, longer described as modern. The welcome signs were described as, quote, being in a multicolored style reminiscent of the 1930s Art Nouveau. <laughs> not as modern, not as psychedelic, not as pop art. Also, there's no mention of how the images related to American ideals. Instead, the press release states that the signs capture the warmth and excitement that visitors feel when entering the U.S. Essentially, the federal government had now rebranded Max and his work. He was no longer the modern art innovator, as stated in the Bicentennial Times, and his work was not modern or psychedelic. It was Art Nouveau. So how did the public react to these signs? Despite GSA's best efforts to indicate public support for the welcome signs, evidence suggests otherwise. Letters of complaints called for their removals. Most letters of complaint, even one from um, George McGovern, <laughs> suggested that the murals should be replaced with pictures of the American eagle or the flag. The signs were gradually taken down and by 1984, the controversy became a historical antidote that exposed a cultural and political shift that occurred in the 1970s. It reflected a conservative backlash against the youth culture and the art associated with this <laughs> culture. It also illustrated how operatives of the Ford and Nixon administration employed a disdain for contemporary art to advance their policies. The result was an assertion by the federal government that modern art is not suitable for portraying the national, in it, uh, the national identity to the general public. Thank you.
Thank you, David. Brian and David have given us a lot to think about in terms of questions of modernism and what is art and what is public art. And so I invite you to keep those thoughts in your head as we move ahead to our next speaker. I'd like to introduce Jeffrey Tillman, who teaches at the University of Cincinnati. He received his MA and Certificate in Historic Preservation to boot and his PhD from the University of Virginia. His research and writing focuses on the history of American architecture between the Civil War and World War II, and he recently published Arthur Brown, Jr., Progressive Classicist, a monograph on the classically oriented architect of San Francisco City Hall and parts of Federal Triangle in Washington, D.C. His research continues to explore the influence of the Ecole de Beaux Arts on American art and design and on the issues that illustrate the difference between the American and European modern movements. He is also a licensed architect in California, and his paper on Julia Morgan and the Ecole brings together many of these threads. Please welcome Jeff. Well, thank you very much. Uh, after all of that uh, racism and drug abuse, we really should move on to sexism, so we will. <laughs> the architects of the American Renaissance have always held a fascination for Richard Guy Wilson, uh, and the most prolific of these was Julia Morgan, the first woman to be admitted to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, the first woman to hold an architect's license, in Wilson's native California, and the designer of William Randolph Hearst's La Cuesta and Cantata, one of the first of Wilson's American castles. Uh, nearly a decade ago, Meredith Clausen called for a more gendered look at the Beaux-Arts, and while I can't offer a first-hand gendered experience of that institution, I can offer this account of Morgan's challenges at the Ecole as told through the voice of her chaperone, Victoria Runyon Brown. The École Nationale Supérieure de Beaux-Arts was the oldest, most significant, and influential school of architecture in the Western world in the late 19th century. Therefore, study at the French National School was a goal of many Americans of Morgan's generation. The decades that bookended the turn of the 20th century saw a veritable flood of Americans travel to Paris, with over 350 attending the school during those years. The École de Beaux-Arts was an organ of the French state, and as such, it was intended to educate promising young French citizens who would serve the state in the private sector after graduation. Thus, admission to the school was restrictive. Students had to be between 18 and 30 years old, and no more than one quarter of the student body could be foreign nationals. Until Julia Morgan's groundbreaking entrance in 1898, they were exclusively male. The structure of the Ecole uh, was very much divided into three parts and organized like a pyramid. The largest group of students, the bottom of my pyramid there, were those who aspired to be admitted to the school but had not yet successfully passed the entrance examinations. These were termed the aspirants. Once formally registered as a student, one entered the second class. Similar to what in the United States would be considered an undergraduate education in architecture, these students took coursework in architectural history, structures and construction, and participated in a number of design competitions. Construction was the focus of the second class, and many of the studio projects required the use of new construction materials, such as iron, steel, and later concrete. One would move up into the first class by placing well in the technical and compositional competitions and by completing the project for the construction course. First class students took no coursework. They only competed among themselves in a set of monthly design competitions, hoping to gain enough credits or valeur to uh, qualify for the diploma, which required a thesis project and a year's full-time apprenticeship to a qualified architect or they were there to compete and win the coveted Grand Prix de Rome and the all-expense-paid trip to Rome for four years that went with it. The story of Morgan's admission to the Ecole has been told many times. I'm, you're probably familiar with it. She was originally supposed to travel to Paris with fellow, fellow Oaklanders Arthur Brown Jr. and his mother, Victoria Runyon Brown, in 1894. Brown was to spend a junior year abroad. Morgan was to begin her preparations for the entrance examinations. However, Mrs. Brown became ill, and the Browns canceled their trip, 
forcing Morgan to delay her travel to Paris to the following year. The Browns did eventually come to Paris in the fall of 1896, after Junior had graduated from the University of California, and Mrs. Brown became a sort of den mother to Morgan and to all the other Berkeley graduates who were studying architecture in Paris in the late 1890s. And in that sense, she was not alone. There were at least eight to ten other mothers there in Paris with her. I mean, what's grad school if you can't take your mom? <laughs> One gained admittance to the Ecole, of course, by passing the rigorous examination that lasted several weeks. In Morgan's time, these were held twice a year, with about 40 students being admitted each October and November and April and May. The examination was both artistic and academic. The artistic exams were exercises in the toisard, painting, sculpture, and architecture. Those who had earned potentially qualifying scores in the arts were then allowed to take the academic exams, which focused on French literature and culture, French and world history, and mathematics and descriptive geometry in that order. The examinations were given in French in the direct presence of the faculty member responsible, and until the early 20th century, the faculty member was allowed to choose the questions and no two students had the same examination. This is why the professor of mathematics who gave the final examination had the ability to bar Morgan from passing the entrance examination. Uh, and so in the result, uh, in the end, they would take the results of each exam, they were compiled by a very complicated prorating formula and would be students were ranked. The top 40 were admitted into the school and the other several hundred aspirants were told to try again in six months. Morgan took the admissions examination three times, performing well enough to earn entry if the faculty had been willing to admit her. With her first attempt, for example, she placed 33rd out of 350 applicants. Normally 40 students would be admitted, but to exclude Morgan, the school chose to only accept the top 30 in that cycle. The question of whether a woman could handle the rigors of the curriculum made her admission a political issue. But in 1898, the French state changed the laws governing the Grand École to require that they admit women to all of their programs. With the persistent lobbying of Bernard Maybeck on Morgan's behalf, he happened to be in Paris at that moment, and a third exceptional performance on the entrance exams, Professor of Theory Julien Gaudet and the rest of the faculty agreed to admit Morgan in November of 1898. The official reaction to the, of the architectural establishment was positive. Le Construction Moderne, for example, wrote that, quote, for the first time since the vote on the law authorizing the admission of women to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, we learn of the admission of a woman to the section of architecture. Mademoiselle Morgan, nationality, American, and as one can see above, she has been admitted 13th of the 40 successful aspirants. This is a great example for our refined young French women, close quote. Now Morgan's entry into the school did not go unnoticed. Many in the architectural community, fully aware of the Spartan conditions of the school buildings themselves and the associated atelier, used the occasion of Morgan's admittance to demand renovations of the facilities. Of chief concern were the toilets, uh, which were primitive at best. A few weeks after the announcement of Morgan's uh, achievement, an op-ed editorial in the Construction Moderne called for private dressing rooms for the female students near the drawing studios and women's restrooms equipped with proper Western toilets, in contrast to the Oriental or Turkish fixtures that were still present in the buildings. The article concluded that, quote, we repeat, decency requires that women admitted to the Ecole be treated there as women with the customs of the well-educated and not that of cowgirls. Now, one might infer from that last term, vachère, that that was a direct reference to Morgan, who, hailing from California, was thought by many in the French press to be a frontierswoman, akin to Annie Oakley, brandishing a T-square instead of a six-gun. I show you what that might look like. 
While it was important to be admitted to the Ecole proper, it was equally important to gain admission to one of the Ateliers Libres, the affiliated studios in which most of the instruction in architecture was done. To be the student, uh, the Atelier was the single most important organization at the Ecole. To join an Atelier was to enter an exclusive club. The patron, or studio teacher, was the unquestioned authority of the Atelier, but the actual management of the studio fell to the Massier, older students who rented studio space, procured fuel and other supplies, collected dues from the other students, and, most importantly, enforced discipline among them. New students were inducted into the Nouveau de Service, the core of students in their first year who were charged with the maintenance of the atelier and in assisting the older students. This usually meant buying firewood or washing the floors, but during the final days of a project, it also meant mixing glue or stretching papers over frames and applying ink washes to a drawing, layer by layer, to achieve the depth of shadows that often won a student a competition. For most students, the atelier became the center of their lives. They were social as well as academic institutions. There was an origin story and a mythology for each, and banners and songs that were distinctly each atelier's own. Entry into these societies were accompanied by an initiation ritual, often formalized into a pageant of sorts, that just as often involved nudity or fire, or sometimes both at the same time. <laughs> each studio's success in the design competitions was carefully observed. Each victory was viewed as an affirmation of an atelier's superiority over its rivals. A victory in one of the prestigious first-class concours, those that carried with them a monetary prize, was usually celebrated with a raucous celebration at a restaurant or other suitable night spot, much like a scene from La Boheme. Each atelier did have a distinctive character in its design work. Emma Jean-Baptiste Paulin's studio, for example, was known for its conventional neoclassicism and its commensurate success in the monthly concours. In contrast, Victor Lelou's studio embraced the free neo-baroque, of uh, the most forward-looking contemporary practitioners as exemplified by Lelou's own Gare d'Orsay, now the Musée d'Orsay. Students chose their atelier for their sympathy for the design aesthetic espoused by the patron, but they also considered other factors, such as the number of Grand Prix winners each studio could claim or the lineage of the atelier. Many Americans chose Lalou's atelier because he had succeeded Jules André, who had been Bernard Maybeck's patron in the 1880s, and André had been a student of Pierre-Jérôme Honoré Dolmé, Charles Fallon McKim's uh, patron. So you'd see there's this lineage that the Americans are following. In the years of the Third French Republic, Americans made up the largest cohort of foreign students at the École de Beaux-Arts. Julia Morgan came to Paris at the peak of the school's popularity with young American designers, and she was joined by nearly a dozen of her classmates from the University of California, all students, as she had been, of Bernard Maybeck. Among Morgan's Berkeley confrères was Harvey Wiley Corbett, John Wake Bakewell Jr., Edward H. Bennett, Arthur Brown Jr., Friar Champney, and Loring Rixford. Uh, you can see a few of them here in the football photo. They're there. Uh, Americans formed a distinct society within the Ecole. They were typically older than the French students and usually already had undergraduate degrees in civil engineering or later in architecture itself. While the French students socialized nearly exclusively with those in the same atelier, to do otherwise was to risk being disloyal to the patron, the Americans had two sets of social identities, that of the atelier and that as an American. The Americans typically shared apartments, and an elaborate system of subleases kept these lodgings in American hands for years, even decades. They made a point of celebrating holidays together, and the Fourth of July and Thanksgiving were particularly opportune moments for the students to proclaim their national identity. One well-known example of this celebration is the famous football game put on by the American students on Thanksgiving Day, 1897, yellow beat red, 6-0. Uh, and the Americans also put on a yearly vaudeville night for the expatriate community in early December. And fortunately, we have no photos of that. 
The highlight of the social calendar at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts was the annual Bal de Cazar, the Ball of the Four Arts, now more commonly referred to as the Beaux-Arts Ball. The first event was organized by Henri Guillaume, the chief massier of the Atelier André in 1892. This was a great success, and so a second ball was held the following year at the Moulin Rouge. This event proved to be a scandal, as the famous artist model, Sarah Brown, or Marie Florentine Roger, she ranged herself nearly nude atop one of the uh, tableau vivant and was subsequently arrested for public indecency. The students of the Latin Quarter rioted in response, and in the end, the government backed down. Revived the following year, the subsequent Beaux-Arts balls became a bit more subdued and were held at more respectable locations. It was also high into this highly charged gender-conscious atmosphere that Julia Morgan bid to enter the occult. Concern for Morgan's sanctity and safety greatly restricted her ability to shape her own education. She was barred, for example, from choosing her own atelier. Instead, she was assigned to Francois Benjamin Chosmiche's Atelier Officiel, which had no separate studio space, no traditions, no raucous esprit de corps. In fact, Morgan for many years was the only student. Morgan's initial assessment of Chosmiche was not positive. He was very much the junior of the Ecole's faculty, as he was then only 34 years old. While he had won a Grand Prix, he had only returned to Paris from his stay in Italy and Greece the year before. He'd been back in town about nine months, and he had not yet built anything. Morgan was almost certainly assigned to Chosmiche because he had been taught by Jules André and mentored by Victor Lalou. And it was probably thought that if Morgan couldn't join Lalou's atelier, as some of her close male Berkeley classmates had done, she could at least be taught by one of his young acolytes. For his part, Chosmiche uh, could not have been thrilled with the assignment either, as he was faced with a fairly impossible situation. Whether he brought Morgan along into the profession as well as he could, or whether she wilted under the demands of the curriculum and the inherent sexism of the institution, he was bound to make powerful enemies on one side of the gender question or the other. In the end, though, over the course of the three years that she spent with him, Morgan and Shoshmis learned to work together despite their significant disadvantages that they both had to overcome. Morgan left Paris in 1902 with Shoshmis, uh, a lifelong champion, ally, and friend. As with many of the students at the Ecole, Morgan struggled to maintain good health. She was very often sick and minor colds and infections grew serious with the fatigue that set in with the long hours demanded by her studio assignments. Victoria Runyon Brown often accompanied Morgan to the doctor and uh, in a letter to her husband, and she wrote two letters a week for about four years. So there's about 300 of these letters. Uh, Brown described one such bout of illness not long after Morgan's admission to the school, reporting, quote, Miss Morgan is supposed to go to the country, but she says she will not, and she will do the analytique, which comes on right now. She has an abscess in her ear. She was suffering very much. I went with her to see the doctor, and she fainted in his office, and I was frightened. She had some sort of spasm and was unconscious for some time. The doctor did not think the abscess theory serious, but did think her general condition is, and told her positively she must rest and take care of herself. Close quote. Um, Morgan was sick probably 50% of the time, it's largely because, uh, as uh, Brown often re reported, uh, she would sleep perhaps six to eight hours over a three-day period. Um, so she was running herself into the ground. As she advanced into the first class, Morgan faced other challenges. For example, she had a great deal of difficulty finding second-class students to assist her in the rendering of her drawings. Typically, the younger students in an atelier assisted the first-class students with the menial work required to produce the large projet rendu that were the mainstay of the first-class work. This was the case even after they completed their year of, as a nouveau de service. However, no Frenchman, nouveau or not, would work for Morgan. 
And while most Americans were willing, they often faced the set de same deadlines Morgan did, and thus they weren't available. Morgan found her assistance where she could. Mrs. Brown, in particular, took great pride in assisting Morgan and in seeing her succeed at the Ecole, and later in practice in San Francisco. Again, from another letter, this one from January 1901, quote, I'm sorry to say that Miss Morgan did not finish her projet on Saturday. Arthur did her coupe, and we, she thought he would fi she would finish. I went down on Sunday and put the plan and coupe under the frames, and it looked fine, but she could not get through with her facade. She felt so badly about it and quite discouraged and gives up all hope of doing her diploma. She has gone on loge today and will go for the rouge man. If she gets good excuses, she will do the projets. Roger Gilman has promised to help her on the uh, rouge van if she should uh, be do anything that the two can work on. It will be hard for her because it's done all loge and mounted there, and of course she will not have any nouveau as the men have. I don't know how she will manage. Well, actually, 1901 was a really good year for Morgan. She had her greatest successes at the Ecole in the last months of 1901, and in placing high in several of the special competitions, including the Prix uh, Godbeuf and this staircase design here, she amassed enough points to complete the diploma were she to complete the thesis project. However, in fact, these successes came too late. Her last valeurs were earned with a theater project that was juried just after her 30th birthday, three days later, in fact, and she did not have time to do the final project. Instead, Morgan had to settle for the certificate, and the two years that she had spent fighting for her place in the school consumed the time that she would have used to complete the degree and do the thesis. Morgan left Paris without the diploma, but with her spirit and determination to pursue a career in architecture fully intact. Morgan worked with Chos Mich a few months prior to her departure for New York and eventually for San Francisco. In mid-July 1902, she returned to the Bay Area, and within a few weeks, she took a position in John Galen Howard's office. The following year, she earned her architect's license and stamp and left Howard to open up her own office. Nearly 800 built commissions later, Morgan became recognized as one of the country's most prolific designers, and several of her projects are nas now national landmarks. In 2014, she was posthumously awarded the AIA Gold Medal, an honor she could not have imagined for herself. In spite of the difficulties she faced in Paris, the illnesses and the constant sexism, as we now say in the 21st century, nevertheless, she persisted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And now I would like to introduce Victor Dupuy, who teaches architectural history and theory, design and representation at the University of Miami in the School of Architecture. He received his architecture degree from the University of Virginia and went on to get his MA from Yale University and PhD in architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on the art and architecture of the early modern Iberian American world in mid 20th century Cuba. His books include Architectural Temperance, Spain and Rome, 1700 to 1759, and Transformations in Classical Architecture, which was published in 2018. From 2016 to 2018, he was the president of Sintas Foundation, which is dedicated to promoting Cuban art and culture. He has curated exhibits on the subject, including Cuban Architects at Home and in Exile, and on Emilio Sanchez in South Florida collections. Both exhibitions have led to publications in production and we look forward to the one on Sanchez coming out in February. His talk this afternoon um, expands on that work. Please welcome Victor. Thank you, Virginia. I, I love your name. Uh, when uh, Lydia introduced me, um, in the session just before lunch, um, she didn't mention that I have the distinct or notorious distinction of being um, one of Richard's failures. I um, was a student at UVA uh, in the School of Architecture, and I realized that I had enough uh, history credits that I could get a minor 
in architectural history, and all that remained was an independent study with a research paper, which I decided to focus on Paul Pels, who um, built a few buildings here and in Washington, D.C., where I'm from. And I had done the research for the paper, and, and uh, at the end of my uh, final reviews uh, in my fourth year, uh, the former dean, Joe Bosserman, who hired Richard, I explained to him that I had this uh, lingering project that I still needed to finish, and he said, oh, Victor, you're going to grad school already. Forget it. And I um, regretted that decision. But um, after graduate school, I realized that I, I really did need to go back and um, get that history degree. So I'm grateful for having put that seed, planted that seed. Uh, today's also a very special day, not just for the community of scholars here, but for America, the Americas, and if not the world at large, because today is the 500th anniversary of the city of Havana. On this day in 1519, the town founders um, held a mass and the first cabildo or town hall meeting under the protective cloak of a giant saber tree. And well, anyone who's been to Havana knows the importance of that city. So, on to uh, my presentation on uh, a cavalier in New York and the Caribbean. In one of his early essays, Architecture and the Reinterpretation of the Past in the American Renaissance, Richard Guy Wilson quoted Bernard Berenson's 1894 book, The Venetian Painters, citing the passage that every generation has an innate sympathy with some epoch of the past wherein it seems to find itself foreshadowed, close quote. This observation not only applied to 19th and 20th century American architects who looked uh, back to the Renaissance in, Euro um, um, in uh, Europe for inspiration, but also for artists who looked to the past and engaged with architectural representation as a way of probing cultural identity. In fact, Wilson pointed out such an American artist in the figure of Joseph Pennell in his 1980 essay, Imperial American Identity at the Panama Canal. Pennell traveled to Panama in 1912 to sketch the construction progress of the canal, as well as the native villages, views of Panama City with its colonial era cathedral, and of course, the irresistible tropical landscape, all of which he viewed through the eyes of the American Renaissance. The Cuban-American artist Emilio Sanchez, a student at the University of Virginia in the early 1940s, is a comparable example of a mid-20th century artist who found great sympathy with the late 18th and 19th century travelers of the European Grand Tour. However, Sanchez was also a modern travel artist, like Pennell, a mobile observer and flaneur of the, New of the North America and Caribbean and Latin America that few of his generation rivaled even if that sort of thing seemed obsolete to the avant-garde abstract artists of the mid-20th century. Emilio Sanchez was born in the rural countryside of Camagüey to an ancient and prominent Spanish family and was among the leading Cuban households in the sugar and cattle industries. Um, that's what their plantation, uh, Central Senado, one of the most profitable sugar plantations in the 20th century. He left um, for the U.S. in 1932 to escape the atrocities of the Gerardo Machado presidency and to study at such exclusive boarding schools as the Fessenden School in Newton, Massachusetts and Choate Rosemary Hall in Wallingford, Connecticut. After his parents divorced in 1937, his mother married the exiled Peruvian writer and painter Felipe Cosío del Pomar and relocated to Mexico, where the latter founded the Escuela de Bellas Artes de San Miguel de Allende. Immediately, Sanchez's travel routine began to shift between Cuba, the U.S., and Mexico. And though he never enrolled in the Escuela, he was exposed for the first time to a stimulating artistic environment led by leading Mexican painters and sculptors. He was clearly hooked 
but his father encouraged him to pursue an artistic career only after having received a proper college education, suspicious that being an artist was a less than reputable profession in Cuba. So if the first presentation was racism, the second one was drug, the next one was sexism, this one was, of course, uh, queer studies because Emilio was gay. And if your son was gay, uh, an artist in Cuba, that was, well, you know, for a macho culture like that. After a brief stint at Yale University, uh, Sanchez transferred to the University of Virginia in the summer of 1941. The university was in the midst of the war years, and life on grounds was very solemn, with isolationists and pacifists seriously studying for fear of failing in their degree and being sent to the military reserves. The impact on the university was significant, Compulsory physical training was required of all students in the College of Arts and Sciences, and the president of the university, John Lloyd Newcomb, allowed for accelerated study in the summer of 1942 so that students in all departments could complete their degrees early. Even Emilio Sanchez, though not yet a U.S. citizen, registered for selective service in Charlottesville in 1942. Emilio spent two and a half years at UVA living in a boarding house near the central grounds with three other roommates, including his friend John Backus, who later became a hugely successful computer scientist with IBM, pioneering several computer programming languages that included Fortran. The other two were Thomas Davies and Larry Viles, both of whom became art collectors and lifelong friends. The university cleared out in the summer of 1943, and the four young men would inevitably part ways. Emilio decided to enroll at the celebrated Art Students League of New York. Sanchez attended the Art Students League for four years while also taking summer courses at Columbia University. Modeled on the French atelier system, thank you for that one, um, Sanchez absorbed the school's traditional training in figurative art and draftsmanship. The League's mission was not to promote poets in paint, but to make thorough craftsmen, good workmen, people who, when they have thrust a thumb through a palette, know what to do with the other hand. We know that Sanchez was taught specifically by three New York artists, Reginald Marsh and Yasuo Kuniyoshi at the League, and Don Kingman at Columbia University. This is the last slide. I want to end. Sorry. How do I go back to the beginning? Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Marsh, described by um, Emilio's stepfather, Cosío del Pomar, as the most intrepid explorer of New York, shared his passion of in situ drawing and painting with the young Sanchez. Emilio would spend his career depicting architectural views of New York City and endless vistas of sunrises and sunsets from across the Hudson River. Equally Marsh-like were his uh, society, society ladies, harlequins, and cabaret scenes that fascinated him as much as the cityscapes. Growing up in Cuba, Sanchez would have understood the uh, so-called choteo, or crass humor and caricature that was particularly popular among all levels of Cuban society. If Marsh taught Sanchez how to observe, the Japanese-American artist Yasuo Kuniyoshi taught him the art of lithography and woodcut printing. The Chinese-American artist Dong Kingman taught Sanchez how to paint brilliant watercolor cityscapes and landscapes in situ. Finally, Sanchez was well aware of the Art Students League's impressive history, as well as the many realist artists that intersected with the school. His stepfather wrote extensively on Thomas Hart Benton, and Sanchez was also a lifelong friend of Will Barnett. Figures such as Stuart Davis that we saw just, I think, two or one or two presentations ago. Edward Hopper and Charles Birchfield inspired him to develop a kind of lyrical architecture that was often devoid of people or any extraneous matter. While a student at the League, Sanchez lived in New York and developed a familiarity with the city, its streetscapes, people, and dramatic vistas. With pencil, pen, and brush in hand, Emilio began to walk the city and draw and paint outdoors, frequently from street level, balconies, rooftops, and dock sides, often mingling among the street vendors and the bustling crowds of the frenzied city. His approach was entirely representational, 
displaying a clear preference for realism over abstraction, but also using memory and imagination to draw a curious parallel between New York and Havana, North America, and Cuba. By the way, his stepfather was very suspicious of abstraction, not because of abstraction per se, but because it was so commercially viable and successful. His stepfather was um, a revolutionary and very much into Mexican muralism. Didn't want, thought that abstraction was just really, really commercial. And Emilio apparently adopted that. As noted by John Angeline in his essay on Sanchez from the book Hard Light, Sanchez has often been referred to as a realist painter, but his is neither the realism of academic conservatism nor the socially engaged activist art that is also suggested by the realist label. Rather, Sanchez occupies a uniquely American territory wherein modernist investigations meet vernacular subject matter. Similarly noted by Richard Guy Wilson in another early essay, Learning from the American Vernacular, the vernacular was both conservative and radical, pragmatically based in experience, but also a source for new architectural solutions. Further down the coast from New York uh, at Cape May, Emilio painted the famous Victorian pink house in dramatic watercolor on paper. Unfortunately, we only have a black and white photo of it. Imagine like the image on the left. Emilio would exhibit the pink house in Paris in 1953, in Havana in 1956, and in both cases, the watercolor's title was changed to In Haiti, giving the impression that the New Jersey Victorian residence was instead a Haitian mansion with the equivalent decorative millwork and black stick figures. Was the switch in title intentional or simply a mistake? We don't know. He often missed... Uh, represented some of his work. But he always photographed and labeled his drawings. Regardless, what is most clear from this early watercolor is that Emilio was drawing comparisons between the Caribbean architecture that he knew so well and comparable examples he found throughout his travels in North America. Now it's time for Grand Tour. From uh, 1948 to 1950, Emilio took several uh, trips to Europe, including England, France, Italy, Germany, and Switzerland. His many sketchbooks are filled with drawings of castles, streetscapes, rooftops, interior scenes of hotels and restaurants, landscapes, and harbor scenes. He completed very few finished works there, and it seems that the primary focus of the trip was to round out his education rather than produce a large body of work. He cites... Um, uh, Turner, uh, as an example of someone who would travel regularly to Europe, produce an abundant amount of sketches, and then go back and produce them in the studio. So he was modeling himself in that sense directly. He also uh, began to uh, visit Cuba on a more regular basis, and travel in Cuba during this period was dominated by North American tastes and preferences. Though as a native, Sanchez was able to move quickly beyond the conspicuous consumerism that governed the island and seek out the true expression of Cuban buildings, landscapes, and people. His Cuba sketchbook from 1949 shows how from the very beginning he was observing architectural details in Old Havana, colored windows known as vitrales, fan lights known as medio puntos, colonnettes, light posts, and balconies fascinated him, with the stained glass in the Havana Cathedral being among his favorite ornaments in the city. His early drawings and watercolors of Havana sought out lesser-known images of the city's streets, plazas, and buildings. Another New Yorker who documented the architectural and political realities of Havana was uh, Walker Evans, who in 1933 produced 31 images to accompany a, a book by the investig investigative journalist Carlton Beals, titled The Crime of Cuba. The book exposed Gerardo Machado's authoritarian regime and U.S. complicity with the bloody dictatorship. The stillness of the image on my far left, en frente al palacio, in front of the palace, reveals the painful reality of poverty and the increasing polarization of life in pre-revolutionary Cuba. Sanchez was, of course, privileged, and travel allowed him to mingle with the elite throughout the island. Of particular interest was his love of the countryside and the savanna landscapes of central and southern Cuba, where his family and friends owned large sugar plantations and cattle farms. 
Trips to Matanzas, Camagüey, Cienfuegos, and Trinidad allowed him to explore both the affluent lifestyles of the island's aristocracy and the vernacular farm dwellings of the local campesinos. His watercolor views of Camagüey from the late 1940s present a series of uh, rustic shacks with figures staring back at him in curiosity. As he explained in a Brooklyn Museum interview from 1965, quote, you see all these places that are completely stark, they're unpopulated, and the house carries itself, as if the house were a person. You can give it a lot of human quality, and you don't see the people, but you can feel them, and you can hear them because they're watching out of every window, close quote. His frenetic view of Ranch El Valle in Camagüey, the one on the right, uh, a pencil and watercolor study of an onslaught of marching palm trees and their uh, intense midday shadows is an excellent example of his early love of plein air painting, the kind of quick study work that could only be done in haste and in situ. Seen together, these early studies of, on the architecture and landscape of Cuba present a rare and critical examination of the island's fabric, its beauty and contradictions from a unique perspective that is equally inspiring as it is melancholy, deeply personal and yet painfully removed. It was around this time in the late 1940s that Sanchez spent a considerable amount of time in San Miguel de Allende, where his stepfather, Felipe Cosío del Pomar, founded the Escuela de Bellas Artes on November 15, 1937. Conceived as the Bauhaus of Latin America, the Escuela served as both a vocational school for the local community of artisans and a un university center for those seeking inspiration in Hispano-American culture. There was even an architectural program for a while taught by the American Bauhaus architect Michael Van Buren, furniture designer as well, I should note, before he settled in Mexico City. The school was under the leadership of Cosío del Pomar, who himself was a reputable painter having studied in Paris in the circle of Picasso, Chagall, and Matisse. The faculty of the Escuela included such renowned Mexican artists as Rufino Tamayo, Carlos Merida, and David Alfaro Siqueiros, all of whom were present throughout the 1940s. Siqueiros in particular produced the unfinished mural of the life of Ignacio Allende that you see on the far right uh, in the school's refectory, a remarkable work of geometric abstraction and intense color that Sanchez would not have missed. It was in this context of Mexican and North American painters, sculptors, muralists, graphic artists, that Sanchez explored the daily life of San Miguel de Allende and its neighboring towns and monasteries through ink, graphite, and watercolor. His preference for depicting architectural scenes of colonial buildings resulted in such work as the facade of the Casa Allende in the center of town. He also produced several portraits of campesinos, saints, and statuary, and perhaps his most stunning work in Mexico to date, uh, folk dancers at the 18th century sanctuary of Atotonilco on the outskirts of San Miguel de Allende. Seems that dancing is another uh, theme that we have been exploring for the last few days. I, I, I can envision dancing this evening at the, in the rotunda. <laughs> Not by me. I'm, I'm the only Cuban-American who um, has no hip sway. <laughs> by the way, somebody said yesterday that the, um, you, can, you can sense the importance of a conference by the number of people that are there. I, I think that in this case, we can also sense it by the number, the amount of humor that has been, I mean, everyone has said a joke, everyone. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. All right, back to Cuba. Uh, at the start of 1950, Emilio Sanchez was approaching his 30th birthday and a new phase of his artistic career was about to dawn. Over the course of the decade, Sanchez traveled throughout the Cuba and to various islands in the Caribbean, such as Jamaica, Haiti, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and Grenada. His work during this period included many more prints, and he began experimenting with oils as well. His beach house, Cienfuegos, was presumably the first oil uh, painting completed in Cuba, and according to the artist, was meant to represent a beach house on, the, um, isle on an island in Cienfuegos Harbor. The striped roof of the house recalls the iconography of a circus tent, and the seven arched bays ostensibly references the porch on the Sanchez family home in uh, Camagüey. The uh, La Carcel, or prison, is an early example of Sanchez's foray into printmaking, and likewise reveals his interest in depicting colonial civic buildings 
inspired by the Hosp Hospital de la Cari Caridad in Santiago de Cuba, this fictionalized building contains red walls, white pilasters, and an open archway in the middle of the composition. His Jamaican women uh, was acquired by several museums and galleries, including MoMA the New York and the New York Public Library. And it's green and white, if um, I should have found the colored one. His 1956 series of uh, bird's eye views of Las Yaguas, um, a shanty town on the southern edge of cosmopolitan Havana that Walker Evans had also photographed, was a powerful reminder of the continuing social problems on the island. By the way, Yaguas are the um, fibrous um, uh, elements of a palm trunk uh, that they would use to thatch in Cuba. The indigent community of 4,000 inhabitants consisted mostly of day laborers living in favela-like constructions of temporary sheathing for which the government provided water and electricity. Their simple huts with dirt floors and shed-like coverings provided incredible geometric patterns that Sanchez found irresistible, like the tenements of New York City. Rural buildings in the Vuelta Bajera region of Havana, Vuelta Bajera literally means uh, below and around. So if Havana's here, the area below and around Havana occupied Sanchez's attention throughout the many years he visited the island. And he produced his most well-known studies as the revolution was gaining momentum. His graphite farmer's house near Matanzas, up, upper left, uh, presents a one-story wooden shack with a front porch, a steeply pitched thatch roof, and blowing laundry hanging on a line attached to the structure's rear. The informally composed two-point perspective view of the house, set on a little knoll with dark shadows underneath the porch and eaves, ennobles the modest structure, revealing its natural beauty in the face of abject poverty. Similar approaches can be found in his farm near Matanzas and shack in Cienfuegos Harbor, all striking works in graphite that reveal isolated buildings in semi-dilapidated states occupying privileged positions within the landscape. Sanchez also provided penetrating interior views of rural structures, often portraying their expressive emptiness, as in the store near Mariel, uh, lower left, the interior hut near uh, Mariel, uh, or the cluttered orderliness of the country store near Mariel. The store's on the right, and the other one's upper left. In these mostly one-point perspective graphite studies, deep views into the interiors of buildings reveal their intricate contrast of materials and playful geometric properties. Sanchez had a fondness for Edward Hopper in the New York Ashcan School, collecting books on them throughout his life. Isolated buildings, depopulated spaces, and the destructive forces of nature and the ephemeral nature of human artifice all appear in these works. There's no pretense or parody, though, just pure form. A series of figural studies result in his charming lithograph, Niños Paseando, uh, Children Strolling, a rollicking group of black stick figure children wearing white hats and clothing parading down a street with their uh, minders set against a rolling landscape of bulbous trees and ominous clouds in the distance. His exceptional graphite study of laundry near Cabañas, upper left, presents a clothesline suspended by a bamboo pole with the laundry blowing in the wind and the attendant shadows dancing on the dirt ground, a study of pure geometry in light and shadow. Finally, his wonderfully playful lithograph entitled Rincón de Cuba, or Corner of Cuba, puts it all together with vernacular architecture, a variety of figures, foliage, hats, and dark shadows underneath an open porch. The focus of the drawing is a striking woman seen from the rear, strolling onto the porch underneath her parasol, while children wearing wide-brimmed hats and other adults stare at the stunning centerpiece. A lone hunched figure, most likely a Cuban grandmother, that is barely recognizable in the dark shadows. She's um, in, in just next to the woman with the parasol. Deep inside that room is, is a Cuban grandmother. Trust me, I know them. Uh, stares back at the viewer as a haunting reminder of human vanitas. Throughout the 1950s, Emilio Sanchez exhibited his work in both solo and group exhibitions, ranging in location from New York to Mexico, Paris, London, Miami, Philadelphia, and of course, Havana. Just when the revolution in Cuba had overthrown the previous government, Emilio Sanchez had matured as an artist. And, and I should also note that um, 
debates on art in Cuba at the time of the revolution privileged um, realism, uh, harking back to the Mexican mural, mu uh, mural movement. And they were very much opposed to New York and Parisian abstraction, which they associated with bourgeois art of capitalist uh, countries. He was exhibiting his work internationally, and his future could not have been brighter. And then, well, we all know what happened. After 14 years of visiting the island on a regular basis, it became apparent in early 1960 that it was time for him to leave Cuba permanently. In closing, the years Emilio Sanchez spent in Cuba from 1946 until 1960 were undoubtedly fundamental to his development as an artist and as a representative of Latin American art in general. The relationship with Cuba was also reciprocal as he not only gained a great deal of inspiration by visiting the island, but also brought with him a New York sensibility and approach that was not represented by anyone else there. While proponents of this period refer to it as the golden age of Cuba and its critics as the mistress of pleasure, Emilio Sanchez was able to cut through the conspicuous consumption and tourism of the island and curate a distinct vision of what was a truly sad and beautiful place. Emilio would spend the next 40 years living in New York and touring around the Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, and Africa, but he would never visit Cuba again. In this sense, Emilio Sanchez presents a unique insight into the complex character of a mid-century modern artist who specialized in architectural representation as a way of searching for a sense of cultural identity in a land to which he would unwittingly never return, but which forever would remain within his soul. The University of Virginia can be pleased to house several works of Emilio Sanchez in their Freyland Museum of Art, including all of these. But more importantly, uh, the university should be proud to consider Emilio Sanchez one of theirs, or we should consider Emilio proud to consider Emilio one of ours. He is a cavalier. Thank you very much. Thank you.